the support. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I promise I'm going to stick uh, to the time limit. I don't really want to stand between people and lunch. So um, I would like to share with you today some of the research that I've been doing over the past couple of years. And instead of really looking at uh, the scale, the things that Dominic really spoke about in terms of the huge global shifts, I wanted to take it a step, make it a bit of a smaller perspective and really look at the individual. And that's been my focus of interest for the last um, several years, is looking at how individuals as the smallest unit could actually have a very big impact on the world around us. So in 2011, Time Magazine named the protester as the person of the year. And this was a particularly significant uh, thing that happened for two reasons. One, it really demonstrated, as we saw all over the world, from Athens to Moscow, from Damascus, all the way to Wall Street, how the power of technology could be used to coordinate mass movements around a shared cause. The second reason why it was so important was that it showed to me that anyone could gain access to these technological resources, tap into these tools that were freely available, and be an agent of change. And this is interesting because they were accessing a scale and a scope of power that had normally been reserved for institutions and governments and big organizations. And suddenly these individuals had power in their hands. This is Mohamed Nabous. Mohamed was a small business owner who lived in Libya during the Gaddafi uprising. And when the uprising started, Gaddafi did a couple of things. I think took a page right out of the dictator's guide for dummies or something, which was he cut the internet to the country, he kicked out international journalists, and he imprisoned any journalists who weren't towing the party line. And the result was it was very difficult for the outside world to figure out what was happening on the ground inside of Libya. So Mohammed was a small business owner, so he didn't like this at all. He decided to take a stand. He went to a local electronic store, bought two handy cams, and using an illegal connection to a satellite, was able to create an online video streaming channel where he would upload the footage of him going out on the streets and capturing the clashes firsthand. Now, in order to demonstrate just how powerful his, it, this, this had on the situation, I want to remind you that during this conflict, it was very hard to get any information. And there came one point where Muhammad's channel was the only broadcast that was coming outside of the country. The videos that he was uploading provided the international community with evidence that Gaddafi was in fact violating the ceasefire that had been negotiated by the United Nations. Unfortunately, Muhammad died while out filming one of the skirmishes. He was killed by a sniper rifle. And when his wife, who came, who took over, uh, made a statement, she said something that really resonated with me, which she said, he never saw himself as a revolutionary. He never wanted to be a martyr. He was simply a man who was 28 years old, who had an internet connection and a camera. And this is really just the beginning of what I believe is a really big revolution in technology. I think that thanks to the technology that's available today, individuals have more power than ever to create change in the world around them. Thanks to things like Twitter and Facebook and text messaging and blogs and access to the internet, we are able as individuals to organize mass movements to communicate with groups of people that before these tools existed was unheard of in terms of reach. And because we're doing that, we are, we are disrupting industries across the board. Changes in government, education, industries, everything from pharmaceuticals to marketing strategy to political campaign fundraising, everything is being disrupted because of this movement. And today I'm going to share with you a couple of stories on what it means moving forward for fundraisers. This is what I call the age of architects. And an architect is any person who uses technology, either creates new technology or uses new technology to rebuild the world around them, to actually architect the world to, to align better with one of their world views. And they can have a skill globally or they can have a skill locally, but the point is, is that they have access to these tools and they, can, and they are big agents of change. The reason why architects are moving and are, and are being driven forward to act, and includes some of the reasons that Dominic mentioned earlier, the rate and pace of innovation is moving so fast 
that companies and institutions and governments simply cannot keep up. Even if they wanted to participate in some of these changes, they often have, are weighed down by bureaucracy and are unable to do so. So what the result is, there's this big gap that's emerging between the systems that we have and the systems that we need. But for the first time ever, instead of just standing by or, or protesting or doing anything like that, it's these small groups of individuals that are stepping forward with alternatives with alternative solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. This is Molly. Molly is a 22-year-old waitress. She's a student at, the university, at a university in the States. And Molly one day received a letter from the Bank of America letting her know that the bank was going to be introducing a new $5 monthly fee for every time when she used her, her debit card. Now, she didn't particularly care for this. She thought it was a bit unfair. So she went on a site called change.org. She created a petition, spread it out into her social networks, and the result, the result was it became viral, started getting picked up by her friends, forwarded by their friends of friends. It got media coverage. And what ended up happening was that Molly collected 300,000 signatures of people who vowed to close their bank accounts if uh, Bank of America went forward with this charge. Now the result was that Bank of America, in the face of such negative press back down and decided to not introduce this charge. But not only that, other banks who had previously been charging their consumers this monthly fee for debit cards, they also scrapped that. Molly is not a community organizer. She's not a lobbyist. She's a student. She's a waitress. She's a regular person who decided to use the tools freely available to her to have an impact. This is Carter. Carter is 14 years old. Carter saw that every time he went to school, all of his friends drank sugary beverages. And when he went home, his mom used to make this big jug of water and she used to put fruit in it as a healthy alternative for them drinking sugary drinks. So he had an idea to create this thing called the Define Water Bottle, which is a water bottle that had a compartment to put the fruit in so that, when you're, so that you can take fruit-infused water on the go. 14 years old. Went to his parents, his parents used the internet, they remotely communicated with patent lawyers and product designers, they came up with a prototype, they took it to the crowdsourcing, the crowdfunding site Indiegogo, raised enough money from their community in order to be able to produce the first run of the bottle, which they did, and it sold out, so he was able to bring a product to market with virtually zero risk. And the result was, is that again, it got picked up, it created change. Carter went on to work with the Global Clinton Initiative as well as Michelle Obama's campaign against childhood obesity, and his response was to create a product that was addressing a problem. So Muhammad wanted to address it through media, Molly wanted to address it through social organizing, Carter wanted to address it through an economic product that could be introduced into a market. All of these people are architects using the technology freely available to them to impact change. What about a bigger cause? We talked about scale. This is a cause called the Open Source Malaria Project, and it is an open community of researchers, scientists, and academics who are committed to collaborating to produce more efficient malaria medicine that belongs in the public domain. So as many of you who work in the drug industry, pharmaceutical industry, the industry is very heavily regulated by patents, and it costs a lot of money to research new drugs. By, by extending this and decentralizing the research across the global network, they're able to make the cost something manageable. And by spreading, by creating it in the public domain, it means that the research that they share can benefit everybody instead of being held by a single corporation. And this is a screenshot of a tweet that was sent out last year of one of the molecules that the team, the, the network, is having a hard time trying to, to, to nail down. So somebody made it this poster of one of this compound, active or inactive, there's a reward. This tweet by, was seen by this gentleman, a gentleman by the name of Patrick Thompson, who is a master's university student um, in Scotland. And he ended up having the research, worked on it for a couple of weeks, and guess what? He was able to create the compound that they were looking for, sent it in, it's being verified by um, his peers, and the entire movement towards making affordable, publicly owned malaria medication took a giant step forward. What this says to me is that often we hear a lot of noise. This is just sort of a visual representation of the ecosystem. And one of the biggest changes that I've seen is that people want to be involved. People are no longer, they can no longer simply be categorized as just donors who can contribute financially because the reality is they're contributing all sorts of things. They're contributing 
technology and research and time and their experience. They're contributing their tools. They're making apps. They're creating new sites. And all that they need is for the organizations that already have the scale to take note and to partner with them. I had a friend of mine who started a nonprofit um, around counseling cancer patients who approached some of the big uh, cancer organizations and was told, no, this isn't really how we do things. So we can't really partner with you. And his organization now has counsel, provided one-to-one -one counseling for close to a million people in the last three years. Why are there no collaborations here? If you're not open to new partnerships, you're going to miss the opportunities that are taking place that are trying to do what your organizations want to do. I want to talk very quickly about three trends, three trends that are taking place to explain this architect phenomenon a little bit better. And the reason I want to focus on three trends is that one, it's like a really easy number to remember. And two, when you start seeing things that are happening, new apps, new technologies, all of this stuff, the instinct is often that, oh, I'm going to focus on this one thing. And then everyone gets overwhelmed because you can't focus on every new thing, every new app, every new platform, because it seems like every week there's something new that comes up that you need to be paying attention to. So instead, if you have sort of these three trends that it provides a context on which you can evaluate it, and then you can see which one is more valuable to spend your time learning more about. The first is data abundance. We are living in an age where data has become cheap and plentiful because, for the large part, we are all producing it all the time. Dominic mentioned some of these trends, so I'm going to skip over them very quickly. There's over 300 million pictures that are posted on Facebook, 175 million tweets, 35,000 hours of YouTube videos that are uploaded. We are constantly providing data into this ecosystem. Now think of all the different types of data that you, are, that you or your family or your friends or your kids are producing. Wearable tech, Fitbit, I have a job on bracelet, it tracks the steps that I take, the hours that I sleep, it tracks my location, it tracks sometimes what I eat, all of these things to help me make healthier choices. Once you add mobile phones and apps, you track your sites like mint.com that help track budgeting and spending and expenditures to help people make better financial decisions. There's the habit factor, which help tracks behavior to help use data to shape habits. There's apps like Bant, which help manage chronic diabetes by tracking uh, sugar levels for people and insulin levels for people that have that condition. There's even my favorite app, the Sleep Cycle app, which is a smart alarm clock that you put on the side of your mattress, the way the picture shows, and you set a time window of when you want to wake up, and it will wake you up when you're not in a deep sleep cycle, so that you don't wake up jarred by an alarm. And it provides an amazing graph of how many hours you've slept quality sleep versus quantity. Now, when I use this app to go back to a regular alarm clock, it almost seems barbaric to me. Like, why? Why would you be awoken up by a jarring noise like that? So these are all of the changes that are happening. When you look at all of the data, what you realize is this is an opportunity for you to get to know people in a way that wasn't possible. Now, this is a data visualization that was created by GE. Um, and every single one of these dots represents somebody tweeting something about breast cancer. Very overwhelming, right? So this is why, how, what are you going to do with all of this information? That's when context comes in. That's when the strategy to identify not just all the information, but the right types of information becomes so handy. So with this tool, what I can do is I can sort it out. Now, it clusters all the people that are talking about breast cancer within a specific context. For example, it's a little hard to see, but walk or awareness, the color pink, the term support. So you start to understand how these conversations are taking shape, and how people are actually engaging with your cause. You can also sort it by individual stories to see which news stories are picking up traction, and the size of the dot is relative to the importance or to the number of times that somebody has mentioned a specific story. And finally, you can even identify individuals. You can identify the individual people inside this ecosystem who are your most local supporters or your most local you know, oppressors, basically. And what this does is that this allows you to target, this allows you to strategize, this allows you to have the real-time data to understand how are people engaging with this cause? How are people talking about it? Who do we need to reach out to? And all of this information just helps us make better business decisions. The second trend is hyper-personalization. And that means that because we're producing all of this data, institutions and brands and corporations have an opportunity to get to know us even better and provide products that are tailored just for us. 
I know many of you use services like Amazon and Netflix and Spotify. You can even create, use Indochino to create custom tailored clothes ordered online with your custom unique measurements. You can use Chocomize and make your own custom chocolate bars. You can use custom coffees and get a specially selected blend with your face on the bag if this is what you want to start your morning off with. But the point is, is all of the data that people are that is being collected is being used to drive this hyper-personalization. And what that means is that that hyper-personalization has become an expectation. We expect now for consumers, or, or we expect now for companies to know what we want, to know what we want to buy, to make suggestions that are relevant to us, to understand our history and our experience and our engagement with the brand in order to make uh, better informed buying decisions. With technology, we're seeing things like the Nest thermostat. And the Nest thermostat is a smart device. It's a thermostat you put in your house. But what it does is that it uses data to learn about your household's behavior to create a custom program inside of your house of when it's going to raise the heat or lower the heat based on when people are home, all with the goal of, of reaching some energy savings. And this is something, you, if you bought a Nest and I bought a Nest, the programs are going to be completely different based on our individual behavior. And this is just the beginning. This is a prototype um, that we came across in our research of an adaptive retail window. Using the Bluetooth in your smartphone, when you walk in front of this window on the street, the images and the, and the things that you see that are being sold to you or proposed to you are going to be unique to your own individual experiences with that store. So for example, if you're walking by the Nike store, in your phone you've got the RunKeeper app or you've shopped at Nike before, it'll say, hey, we see that you're training for a 5K, by the way, we have a sale on this particular shoe, which is targeted towards you know, short distances, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to become the norm, this is the beginning. And here's a really interesting one. The University of Florida recently created a prototype of an antenna pill, where when you take it, it sends data to your doctor confirming that you have indeed taken your medication at the appropriate time. As many of you know, compliance to medicine is a really big issue in the healthcare system. This is going to make sure that your doctor knows that you took your pill at the right time, in the right dose, and that you've completed the treatment, helping you to become healthier. The third uh, the, the third trend is shared value tribes, and this is all about community. So now that we're building the world in our image, now that we're creating all of this data, we want to find other people who we can share our, our values with. And the big shift here is that thanks to technology, we no longer have to depend on, um, on things like proximity. If I am a firm believer in the ethical treatment of animals, I don't have to just count on you know, the fact that I hope that there are people in my town that also believe it. I can go online, I can be connected to a global community of people that care about the same things that I do. And when you, you have a community of people and, have tr and you have trust, what ends up happening is those people have micro-influence. And we see with examples like Molly and Muhammad and Carter, when you have trust and influence, people listen to what you say. This is Judy. Judy is what's called, calls herself a hauler. And a hauler is a type of internet um, celebrity, quote unquote, many of them are often young women, and what they do is that when they go shopping, they come back home and they go on their webcams and they show you every single item that they bought. I went to Target and I bought this t-shirt, I went to Shoppers Drug Mart, I got this mascara, and they review it. I really liked it, I really hated it. Now Judy has nearly 122 million views on her YouTube channel. When Judy recommends a product, retailers see a bump a spike in sales because the people who watch her channels go out and they buy it. This is a, my friend Johnny that I was mentioning earlier. He created an amazing network called Immigrants Angels that provides one-on-one -on -one counseling support. He was able to create a global network where if you have cancer, they will match you with somebody who has the same type of cancer, at this, either um, in remission or who's going through the same thing, so that you can have that personalized counseling with somebody who really understands your medical situation and who has been there before. They will even partner, if you have a sister who is battling cancer, they will, they will match you up with somebody else who has a sister who's battling cancer. And again, it's using that data to create this hyper-personalized experience, which ends up drawing people together based on shared value. I will say that while I do have a very 
optimistic view of how these tools can be used. Realistically speaking, the internet is a neutral tool that can be used for good and for evil. And I did want to highlight a negative example because it's definitely not all rainbows. This is an image that I pulled off of a pro-ana community. A pro-ana is people who are pro-anorexia, pro-eating disorder, who actually come together to exchange tips and tricks about it. This is called thinspiration. It's when generally young girls pick images off the internet and put inspirational messages on them. This one says, if it takes dying to get there, so be it. They also provide things like goals, to have legs that don't touch, and a very disturbing interpretation of the nutritional pyramid, where, as you can see, water, diet pills, diet sodas, and food to be used sparingly. So just as all of these things, the data and the hyper-personalization can be used for good, it's also important to note that it's all about the intent. And for every good cause, I can probably list you 10 causes of where it's being used negatively. But that's not, you know, that's not really the point. The point is, is that we have the power to do that. And sometimes architects have a negative worldview that they end up building around them. So a lot of my research has focused on what's happening out in the world. And the subject of my new book, which is called The Decoded Company, was really about what happens when all of us, when all of those things get applied inside the organization. And it's really interesting because why is it that I can wake up in the morning and listen to a customized playlist and drink my custom blend coffee and, you know, have all of it, wear my custom made shirt and then I get to work and it's all this one size fits all nonsense where performance reviews are the same and policies are the same and evaluations are the same. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I'm going to leave you with just one quick example of the potential of what happens when companies internally start applying some of these things about the data abundance, the value shared communities, the hyper-personalization. And a quick note, Dominic mentioned the need for chief digital officers. We're starting to see now there is a demand for chief data scientists, for people who are skilled at collecting that information and, make, and translating it into effective strategic priorities for your company. This is something that has just started to happen within the last I'd say two years. Last year, Google hired their first people analytics officer, and we think this trend is only going to continue. So here's the last example before lunch, which is Google launched this product, this product, this project called Project Oxygen. And what they did was they wanted to answer this question about could you build a better manager? What makes a better manager? And they launched this whole project where they went out and they researched 100 different variables, gathered 10,000 data points, 400 pages of interview notes, and months and months of effort, and they generated this list of eight best practices that came out. So here are the best practices. I'm just going to list them up here. Now, as you can see, your first reaction might be they have to spend all that time to tell people to express interest in team member success and personal well-being, like talk about a really big waste of time. But the interesting thing that happened was when they prioritized these eight, um, these eight factors based on what, what their employees thought was most valuable, this one, number eight, have key technical skills so you can help advise the team, ended up being number eight. Why is that important? Well, unfortunately, it just so happened that for the last several years, the hiring managers have prioritized technical skills as number one meaning that they were looking for people above all else who had a superior technical skill so that if engineers had a question about a product, their manager could help them. Unfortunately, the data said that that was the least important thing, which explained why on a lot of reviews, people were, were rating their managers poorly on interpersonal skills because that wasn't a hiring priority. So once that came out, they realized that their entire recruiting practice was backwards. And based on that information, they implemented some changes. They created specific skill trainings to target behaviors that would embody those eight values. Managers who had, who were, who had reviews where they had some challenges with areas um, noted a 75% improvement in performance after just one year. And what's interesting about this is that it was a customized solution. They took the abundance of data they hyper-personalized it to identify the skills that were most important to their company. And finally, they were able to target certain value base to make sure that their culture became shared the same set of values. This is only one of many case studies that we've spent the last two years researching. 
But ultimately, the message is the same. Data is here, data is powerful, it can be used for good, it can be used for evil, but ultimately, if you don't know how you're going to use it, you are going to be left behind. Now, my final thought is just a quote that I leave you, which I feel like fully embodies the spirit of architects, and that's by anthropologist Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, citizen, thoughtful committed citizens can change the world, because indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much.